We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. I'm going to jump to verse 15. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your grace today. Lord, even as we've heard a hard teaching, we know that your grace is sufficient. Lord, that you're not looking for perfection, but you're looking for those who lovingly serve you and obey your word, follow after you with their whole heart. We pray you'd help us not to settle for a watered down or self-imposed version of following Jesus. But we would truly follow your word, follow your teaching, follow the example, Jesus, that you gave us of sacrificial living, of loving, and experiencing the fullness of life that you promise us. We invite your spirit to be here, to speak to our hearts. I don't know what everyone here is going through, Lord, but you do. So I pray Lord, you would illuminate our hearts. You would give us a now word. What do you want to say to each of us individually? Lord, Holy Spirit, we say speak for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. How many of you are brand loyalists? Like you are really loyal to certain brands. Anybody in the room? Come on. Like anyone, like really loyal iPhone user. Come on. Yeah, uh, or, or uh, maybe uh, really loyal to a certain car brand that you love to drive, right? There's a couple of folks in the room. Yes, brand loyalism is, is a big part of our culture. And growing up as a kid, I was especially loyal to certain brands. Um, I never let anything but Nike or Jordan touch my body for, the, for like 10 years of my life. And uh, if you tried to get me to wear Reeboks, it would be blasphemy. And uh, that's just how I was from maybe 15 to 25. And um, I was just very loyal to specific brands. One of the things that I was really loyal to uh, was um, this brand of mustard. Um, <laughs> you know, put that on the screen. I'll, I'll go back to the title. There it is. The world's best mustard, French's mustard. I was convinced as a child that there was nothing like French's mustard. I bought into the hype that it's American flavor in a bottle, even though it's named after the French. <laughs> I don't know why we don't call it freedom mustard at, at some point <laughs> throughout. But, uh, and I, I, my, I now, now that I have kids of my own, um, of our, our own, I don't know what, they don't belong to me, that sounds weird, but anyways, now that we have kids in our household that we care for, um, they, 
uh, they are starting to eat more and more. And um, sometimes already at nine and seven or eight and seven now, they are uh, just out eating us some days. And so you have to try to cut some corners. Amen, somebody? Uh, when it comes to just like the cost of food. And my mom would try to do that, you know, when things weren't on sale. It's like, can I find something that is just uh, on sale to sort of replace it? And she would try to buy the other brands of mustard. I would tell her, if it ain't French's, it ain't mustard, and I don't want nothing to do with it. <laughs> so one week, she decided that she was going to buy the Safely brand um, mustard and replace, the, replace it into the French's, <laughs> right? To see if it was just brand loyalty or, or if it was actually my palate. And I remember taking one bite of the sandwich that day and said, something's wrong with the mustard. This is not French's mustard. She pulls out the bottle. Yes, it is. I'm like, no, it ain't. It's like, I don't, something's wrong. Go get some new mustard. And I walked out of the kitchen and I wouldn't eat my lunch. Right? Why? Because it ain't French's. It ain't mustard. There's something about knowing the real deal that the counterfeit just... It, it doesn't satisfy. It's not the same. When it comes to our faith, we want to have the real deal. We want to have the genuine article. We don't want a counterfeit. We don't want a substitute or a half-baked version of the real thing. So our title, our, our conversation this morning is, For Real Though? For Real Though? Is it real? <laughs> this is the question we're going to explore today uh, because the truth is, there is a lot of different versions of Jesus in our world. There's a lot of different versions of following Jesus that we see. In fact, I've noticed this. I've noticed that almost everybody has a version of Jesus. Have you noticed that? Like, Jesus is so compelling, uh, so influential, that everybody wants a piece of Jesus. <laughs> um, you know, some call him a prophet. Uh, to the Buddhist, he's a great teacher. Many Hindus say Jesus was one of our deities, reincarnated. A Sikh teachers say he's a saint and a holy man. But here's what was interesting. Richard Dawkins himself made headlines a few years back when he said this. He said, um, someone as intelligent, as intelligent as Jesus would have been an atheist. And so even Richard Dawkins was like, he's on our team, guys. <laughs> Here's the thing, in our search for the, quote, real Jesus, uh, if it brings us to somebody who strangely looks similar to us, who strangely holds the same ideals that we hold and never questions our way of living, then you haven't found Jesus of Nazareth. If, if Jesus of Nazareth looks like a white Republican or a hippie progressive, there's no variance. Just, for some reason, he looks just like that. Then you haven't found Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is a compelling, yes, but he also confronts our ways of live, thinking and living. If we want to know the real Jesus, we can't c try to make him look like how we want it to be. We tend to conform Jesus into our image rather than to be transformed into his. And we all are guilty of this. It's not just the world's religions or even followers of Jesus. Oftentimes we try to conform Jesus into our own image rather than be transformed into his. And there's two mistakes that we can't afford to make. The first one is having an incorrect or incomplete version of Jesus. And the second mistake we can't afford to make is having an incorrect or incomplete approach to relationship with him. Because if we get these two things wrong, we've missed the mark of what it means to follow Jesus. And so this is actually much of what John is addressing in this letter. He's dealing with the people who have tried to fit Jesus into their deeply rooted worldview rather than allow him to change their worldview. And they have uh, also decided uh, how they're going to approach him in their own way. And so they've decided who Jesus is and what a relationship with him should look like. And John says, I want to show you what it really is. Should look like. I want to show you what a real relationship with Jesus looks like. So the question we're exploring this morning is, what does it mean to know Jesus and have entered into a genuine saving relationship with him? We, we know that we're saved by grace through faith, 
but there is an outflow. It looks like something. There is evidence. We should be able to look at our life and say, yeah, that's what a follower of Jesus looks like. That's, that's what it means to enter into a genuine saving relationship with him. Or in other words, maybe a, a more sh- short, less theological way to say that is, how do I know that I truly know Jesus? How do I know that I truly know Jesus? And so John shares with us a few tips for how to do that, how to identify it. That's the good news. We don't have to debate about it. We don't have to debate with one another about it. All we have to do is read this letter because he gives us some, a very clear picture of what it looks like to truly know Jesus. And so I'm going to give you a couple. I'm going I'm to give you the first one that David will come up and, and expound upon some others. But the first one and this is probably the most obvious and it's implied at the beginning of the text. If you want to know, if you truly know Jesus, you have to actually know him. Like, that seems so obvious and silly. Why would you have to say that? Because how many of you know, if you've ever been like in a conversation like, oh, you know so-and-so? There's a tendency in us to be like, yeah, I know them. You, you have no idea who they're talking about. You know, I know them. I went to that school. So, and they're like, so you know so-and-so? Yeah, yeah, I think... <laughs> Sometimes we do that with, with Jesus. Like, oh, I, I know him. I know him. This is the difference between knowing about someone, knowing someone's name, and actually knowing them personally. We've talked about this, that the Greek word there used implies an intimate knowledge, a personal experience with someone. Not just head knowledge, not just an understanding, not just, hey, I know their Wikipedia page. I've memorized everything about them. But it's actually knowing them personally. And so when it comes to finding out if we truly know Jesus, it's more than just I, I've memorized facts about him. I, I, I know his teaching, but it's actually having what some may call a personal relationship with him. So we have to know Jesus personally. Uh, more than being a secret admirer or a Facebook stalker of Jesus, we want to know him personally. Now, in many church circles, people call this having a personal relationship with Jesus you, or knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I want to say this. that uh, In the past, I have not liked this saying one bit, um, not just because it's become a modern meme for socially awkward and insincere attempts at evangelism. Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? But also because it feels like it turns Jesus into like some sort of pocket little Messiah that we carry around with us. He's my personal Lord and Savior. And, 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 and we can just, you know, reach for when we need him, right? When he kind of, kind of at our beck and call, he's our personal Lord and Savior, you know, but we know that Jesus is, is not confined to just our little life that we can control, but he's actually like the Lord of the universe, right? And so sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I really love that saying, but I think there are some important things that it provides for us. Because it's important for us to remember that Jesus isn't our family's faith. He's not our family's faith. He, he's not, you know, uh, in, in God's family, there are no grandchildren. Only children. Only those who are directly linked to him. We don't get to know him through a pastor, a grandma who's praying for us. That's great. But at some point, we make that personal choice to say, I want to follow Jesus. And so maybe I'm giving this statement too much credit, but if I was to sort of qualify what it means for Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, it would be something like this. Someone who has a personal relationship with Jesus has wrestled with the life and teachings of Jesus, the meaning of his death on the cross, and the implications of the resurrection, and they said, yes, I believe that. I will receive Jesus as my Savior and my Lord, and I will make this faith my own faith by choosing to follow Jesus in the waters of baptism. And for those of us today, we're, hey, we're celebrating Father's Day. It's like this is our mandate as fathers is to not just force someone into faith, but to help them have their own faith. That's why it's important to sign our kids up for things like kids camp to provide a space for them to make it their own faith rather than just their faith of their family. So we need to know him personally. Number two, we need to know him intimately. Intimate knowledge, up close, personal knowledge of Jesus. Every relationship that you have ever developed in your life requires some form, some level of intimacy, of up close personal experience and knowledge of one another. 
It's like after the, the disciple Thomas, he touched Jesus' wounds, right? He said, my Lord and my God. He had this intimate encounter with Jesus. And so how do we develop intimacy in our lives? We, we spend time with Jesus, obviously, right? Just like we would spend time with somebody else. We spend time in his word. We learn Jesus' voice. We learn Jesus' teachings. We learn his sense of humor. Uh, we learn his anger. If you haven't read the teaching of Jesus and, and laughed a little bit, you don't quite get Jesus. Jesus, Jesus has a, a, a sharp sense of humor. Uh, he's funny. He's sarcastic. He's, he, he, he's, he loves to speak in hyperbole and be a little dramatic sometimes to get his point across, right? That's Jesus. And so we should read things that, and, and say, wow, that's, that's fascinating. We should read things that make him angry and start to feel uncomfortable ourselves, Right? Like, if he's angry about that, why am I not angry about those things in my own life? This is how, one of the ways in how, how we develop a relationship with Jesus. If you're curious about Jesus, study the life of Jesus. Uh, study Mark. Mark's the most direct, the most easy to read, just straight to the point. Read John, the most poetic and flowery and descriptive. Uh, uh, if you want the full version, read Matthew. It's really long. And um, my favorite version is where Jesus is eating a lot and hanging out with the poor. And that is the book of Luke. And all these teach us about the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, his practices, his rhythms. We spend time with them. We meditate on Jesus' life and his teachings. We take time to soak them in and creatively live by them. Number two, how do you develop intimacy? You engage your whole self. You engage your whole self with Jesus. You bring your whole self to that relationship. I was just speaking with a friend this week about oftentimes we're taught to, to deny our emotions and our feelings and just say, those are wrong, those are not what God's truth is, and just leave them out of our relationship with God and only engage with him with our minds, with our belief system, but never bring our, our full self, our wounds, our pain, our hurt, our frustration, our anger, right, to our relationship with Jesus. How many know there's no such thing as a close relationship with someone when you can't bring all of you to that relationship? There's something about bringing everything, bringing our good things, our bad things, and there's something mystical and beautiful about intimacy with God. It's like feeling like you're, you're being brought close to him. That happens here every week in worship. I see people, they're just, not only are we singing these songs, but we, we, we sense Jesus is drawing near to us. There's, a, there's an intimacy there that happens, but it can also happen in your personal, private prayer life. It can happen in a spiritual conversation with a friend. Um, but you know, it's like this intimate feeling like, wow, God is near. Paul talks about that. Like, like people will come to your gatherings and say, wow, God is here. There's, he's drawn close to me. Thank you. And, and when he does that, sometimes we, we cry, sometimes we laugh, sometimes we want to kneel down and just honor his presence. But th the biggest thing that I experience when he draws near is just gratitude. Thank you for being near. Thank you for drawing close. Thank you for loving me. Uh, I happened to run into someone at the airport and strike up a conversation on my way out, and um, we started talking about faith, and she asked me, you know, how I became a pastor and what that looked like, and so I shared my, my testimony about the first time I experienced Jesus drawing near to me, and I said, I just experienced the love of God like I never, I, I just knew that I was loved, and now the reason why I do what I do is because I want to let other people know that they're loved. I want them to have that experience of the love of the Father because it brings healing, it brings life, it brings hope and transformation to our lives. But here's the challenge I want to give you, and I don't have time to preach a whole message on this topic, but sometimes we also have to have intimacy with Jesus without feelings. For some of us, bringing our feelings is hard. And for others of us, it's so easy that when we don't feel something, we feel like we're disconnected from him. And there's actually this process, this thing that happens in the, in the, in the life of following Jesus where the honeymoon season kind of dissipates and all of a sudden there will be moments and seasons where we don't sense and don't feel like God is near. I remember the first time that happened to me as a college kid, I started freaking out. Like I didn't know that I always felt God's nearness until it wasn't there. And then I was like, what's happened? Where did he go? I'm like, guys, pray for me. I, don't, I haven't felt God in like three days. And, and one of my friends was like, really? This is the first time this ever happened to you? Are you serious? Like, yeah, pray for me, you know? Um, and uh, spiritual writers call this a dark night of the senses. Uh, uh, 
uh, if you've read Dark Night of the Soul, it's sort of the first level of what he would call a Dark Night of the Soul. But Dark Night of the Senses, where you can't feel God, you, you haven't experienced God, you don't know where he is, and it's actually a part of our maturity and development. It's a normal part of our walk to learn how to love God, to believe in him, to trust him, and to be near him, even when we don't feel him. So here's what Robert Mulholland said. We depend on cognitive assent and effective assurances to substantiate the reality of our relationship with God. If we can't know or feel God, we customarily doubt our relationship with God, but such knowing and feeling restrict God to the narrow limits of our minds and senses and reduce our relationship with God to the maintenance of such feedback. The dark night of the senses brings to move, it begins to move us beyond such dependency to an unconditioned relationship with God. So how do we know that we really know him? Well, number one, we actually know him. We actually get to know Jesus personally and intimately. And then that becomes the basis, the place, the outflow for everything else we're going to talk about this morning. All right, David, bring it on. That was actually pretty good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Not bad. I do have a question, though. How come you get that fancy head mic thingy? <laughs> yeah, I only get this. I, just wondering, you know. I only have one. <laughs> yeah, okay. And you get it? <laughs> I thought you were a Christian. Ugh. Okay. As Pastor Sean has stated, the overall question that we are dealing with this morning is this. What does it mean to know Jesus and be in a genuine saving relationship with him? Now, there are a lot of answers out there, but they can't all be correct. So what's the correct one? What's the true one? What's the answer that gets us the real mustard? Let's read, what, uh, let's read again the first couple of verses from 1 John chapter 2 in our passage. We know that we have come to know him... If we keep his commands, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Okay, let me rephrase what John wrote this way. If our relationship with Jesus is not producing in us an ever-increasing obedience to Jesus in every area of our lives, then we don't know Jesus. Now, to make sure I am not misunderstood, let me be quick to add that John is not talking about perfection, but he is talking about demonstrable ongoing progress. With that in mind, let me read that statement again. If your relationship with Jesus is not producing in you an ever-increasing obedience to Jesus in every area of your life, you do not know Jesus. I know, I know, that definition of knowing Jesus is not what most of us have been taught. It sounds extreme, harsh, legalistic, dangerous even. I mean, requiring that kind of obedience is the mark of a cult. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jesus does, in fact, demand absolute obedience from his followers. For example, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, we have these words of Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Yeah. Notice, Jesus began those instructions by claiming all authority in heaven and on earth. In other words, he was speaking at the as the king of the universe with the right to command his subjects to do whatever he wanted them to do. And his instructions include teaching his followers to obey not just some, but everything he commanded. What this means 
is that a commitment to pursuing ongoing growth toward absolute obedience to Jesus is not an option for Christians. It is essential. It is what it means to know Jesus. Now, in making this demand, Jesus is not requiring anything of us that he himself did not do. As he said in John 15, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. When Jesus walked the earth, he lived in a relationship of absolute obedience to the Father. But his obedience was not out of fear of punishment or out of a sense of obligation. He didn't do it because he had to. He did it because he wanted to. Jesus in the, and the Father were in a mutual love relationship. And absolute obedience to the Father was the way Jesus expressed his love. It was his delight, his passion. And in return, he experienced the full ongoing blessings of the Father's love for him in everything he did. Now, someone may respond, and, and naturally, I get it. I thought the Bible said we were saved by faith in Jesus. It does, and we are. So let me be clear. We do not obey to earn God's love. We do not obey to earn God's love. We obey in response to God's love. Obedience is how we express our faith and love in Jesus just as it was for him in his relationship to the Father. And as we just read, a loving faith-based obedience is the means by which we receive and enjoy the blessings of Jesus' love for us, what the Apostle John in his letter calls eternal life. The kind of relationship Jesus had with the Father is exactly the same kind of relationship that he is inviting us as his followers, followers into with him. Now, what we have learned so far is that the way to receive and experience the eternal life Jesus offers us is through the devotion of our lives to an ever-increasing obedience to Jesus in everything as our faith responds to Jesus' love for us. Again, we're talking progress, not perfection. What this means is that to know Jesus, what this... Da -da. This is what it means to know Jesus. Thank you there. I have verbal dyslexia, you know? Not only do I read funny, I talk funny mix. Okay. What this means is that to know Jesus... I did it again. Here we go. This is what it means to know Jesus. Well done, Dave. Which logically leads us to ask, okay then, what does Jesus command us to do? Well, here's John's answer. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. In the verses we have already looked at, John tells us that if we want to know whether our relationship with Jesus is the real thing, the acid test is whether we are devoted to living in absolute obedience to him. In these verses, John is now telling us that if we want to know whether we are living in absolute obedience to Jesus or not, the acid test is whether we are devoted to loving one another. This is because the entire will of God is summed up in one command, love one another. John got this straight from Jesus, as we find in the Gospel of John, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's important to note that the love Jesus demands of us is not natural human love. The love Jesus requires is a totally different kind of love. It is literally God's very own love. 
Now, what's the difference between human love and God's love? Let's start with the definition of love. Contrary to popular opinion, love is not primarily a feeling. Love often produces loving feelings, but feelings come Love often produces loving feelings, but feelings come and go. We can genuinely love someone even when in the moment we don't have loving feelings for them. This is because at its core, love is not a feeling. It is a choice to act. It is the choice to give of ourselves for the good of another. Now, natural human love shares this definition in common with God's love. But there are two absolutely critical things that distinguish natural human love from God's love. First is how we determine what is good for the other. Human love bases that on human wisdom. God's love bases it on God's wisdom. Second... Human love is conditional, whereas God's love is unconditional. What I mean by that is human love always has conditions attached to it. Human love is more than willing to give of itself, even sacrificially, for the good of another, as long as it believes it will get something it wants in return, or it will love as a form of repayment for something it has already received. But if hum- but human love has limits. If it gets to the point where it's thinking it's not getting enough of what it wants or it deserves, it stops. But God's love has no limits. This is because God's love doesn't give in order to get or because it has already received. God's love be- gives because it values the other person. God made us all in his image. He values us as beings in his image, every one of us. And he chooses to give of himself for our good. And it doesn't matter what we do or don't do. In the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians, we get possibly the clearest picture of God's love in action. Challenging the Philippians to love with God's love, Paul points them to Jesus as the prime example. And we read, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped and held on to at all cost, but he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, be, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The essential characteristic of God's love is that instead of holding on to its rights, demanding that others treat it, at it as it deserves, as it rightfully deserves, it lets go of its rights so that as a humble servant, it can sacrificially give itself to others as they need it to for their good. This is exactly what Jesus did. Instead of holding on to his rights and privileges as God, that is equality with God, instead of holding on to that, demanding that we treat him as he deserves as God, he let go of them. In loving obedience to the Father, he emptied himself. He let go of his rights and came to us humbly as our servant, allowing us to reject, despise, deny, betray, and even kill him unjustly. He did that so that he would be able to sacrificially give of himself to us in love in the way we so desperately needed him to love us. Now, whenever we get serious about pursuing this kind of love, two questions naturally arise that need to be taken very seriously. Unfortunately, in the time that Pastor Sean has given me, I can't do more than offer anything but the beginning of an answer. We can talk later if you need more. Okay. 
The first is that loving others with God's love sounds like we were being told that we need to be doormats, that we're just to give people whatever they want, let them do whatever they want, even to us. God's not telling us to be doormats, is he? No, he is not. I need to be very, very clear on this because tragically, false understandings of this teaching have been used and continually to be used to brutalize many, especially women, by forcing them to stay in dangerous, abusive situations in the name of loving the other with God's love. So let me say it again. God is not telling us, commanding us, inviting, asking us to be doormats. In loving someone with God's love, we are not sacrificially giving of ourselves to satisfy whatever desire a person might have. That is not love. What we are doing is sacrificially giving of ourselves for their good. And there is often a huge difference, demonstrable difference between the two. For example, a wise, loving parent knows that it is good for their children to go to bed at a certain time. They need their sleep. So what does a wise, loving parent do when a child begs them to stay up past their bedtime so that they can continue playing their favorite video game. The wise and loving parent responds, no. <laughs> and the wise, loving parent stays lovingly firm on this matter, no matter how much of a tantrum their child throws. Even though you are exhausted and don't feel like you have the energy to battle with your child, still, for they, their sake, you pray to God, God, give me strength. And you commit yourself to holding on, hanging in there, staying firm for as long as it takes. You willingly endure the pain this involves because you love them and know that this is what they need from you in this moment for their good. Loving your child with God's love does not mean sacrificially giving of yourself to supply whatever their little hearts desire. It means as a humble servant to your child, you sacrificially give of yourself for their good. Now, admittedly, sometimes sacrificing yourself for the other person's good does feel like we are letting them walk over us. But even in those situations, we are not doing it just because it's what they want. We are doing it because in God's wisdom, that is what is ultimately good for them. And because of our love, both for God and for them, we willingly, we are willing to sacrificially give ourselves to them in this way. But because God's love is for their good and is according to God's wisdom, there are also many times and in many ways that sacrificially giving of yourself for the other person's good means saying a loving but very firm no. Now, there's a lot more that needs to be said to provide a full answer to that question, but that gives us a start. The second question arises out of the fear that if you let go of and don't fight for your rights, your needs and desires will never be met. You're afraid you'll always be giving and never receiving. And you know it sounds selfish, but you can't help but say, what about me? <laughs> the answer is simple, but it takes a lifetime of spiritual growth to live it out well. We trust God to meet our needs, guarantee our rights, and satisfy our deepest longings. Let's look again at Philippians chapter 2. Now, in the part that we've already looked at, we saw that in coming to earth, Jesus let go of his rights and privileges, allowing himself to be rejected, despised, denied, betrayed, and unjustly crucified. Now, how, what did God do in response? This is what Paul the apostle wrote. Therefore... What's the therefore? Well, here's a thing I learned at seminary. Whenever you see the word therefore, you look to see what it is there for. <laughs> Clever, huh? I like it. Okay. Therefore. Well, therefore is what Jesus did. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that the 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's what the apostle Peter wrote about this situation. For to this you, us, as followers of Jesus have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. What did he do instead? He continued entrusting himself to him, the Father, who judges justly. Jesus knew how it would turn out for him in the end. Jesus was able to completely let go of the expectation of having his rights and privileges and deepest desire fulfilled in this life because he trusted God to more than fulfill them in the next. And it is exactly the same for us. Jesus promises us that as his followers in this life, God will provide us with everything we need to obey the Father in his call for us to sacrificially love others with God's love. And in the next life, he promises glory beyond our wildest imagination. So just like Jesus, we must learn to let go of the expectation that our rights, privileges, and desires must be fulfilled in this life. And instead, we must learn to wait on God in confident trust, knowing that everything we willingly give up in this life will be made up for a million times over in the next. Far, far more than we could ever deserve. Again, I know this doesn't answer everything for that question, but it's a start. The main idea we have learned so far from this morning's passage is that if we want to know whether our relationship with Jesus is the real thing, the acid test is how well we are obeying Jesus. And if we want to know how well we are obeying Jesus, the acid test is how well we are loving others with God's love instead of human love. So here's my reflection question for us this morning. How well are you loving others with God's love instead of human love? If you're serious about wanting to know the truth to the answer for you in that question, I've learned that one of the best ways is by taking a hard, honest look at the way you relate to those closest to you. I find it to be the supreme irony of life that my wife, the person I love the most in the world, is also the person I struggle the most to love with God's love. And it has nothing to do with her. She's great. But no matter how lovable she is, and she is very lovable, we are two very different people. And because of this, we find at times that our we find ourselves experiencing our differences in a way that create tension and conflict. Not because we don't love each other, but because simply we're different. And whenever that happens, my natural tendency is to think that I'm right and she's wrong. I mean, obviously. <laughs> and when we don't respond well to those differences, my natural tendency is to think that she sinned against me far worse than I may have sinned against her. Again, I mean, obviously. <laughs> and in my prayers about the situation, because as a Christian, obviously, I pray about those situations. Here is my prayer. God, help Sue see her sin, come to me in humble repentance, <laughs> confess her sin, and ask for my forgiveness so that we can be reconciled. I mean, obviously. <laughs> People... That is natural human love in its clearest and most obvious form. One of my spiritual practices is something called the daily examine. It's where I take about 15, 20 minutes every day to prayerfully review with God the previous day. There are several parts to this review. One of them is to ask the Spirit to show me any time I may have failed in some way to live like Jesus. And for me, a frequent topic that he is bringing up is how I relate to Sue if we happen to experience one of those times of tension and conflict. I asked the Spirit to help me see the truth of how I responded. 
Did I respond by selfishly demanding my, my rights, refusing to give of myself for her good because I wasn't getting what I thought I deserved or wanted? Or like Jesus, did I, in obedience to the Father, choose to let go of my rights and humbly relate to her as her servant, seeking to give of myself for her good without any thought of what I was or was not getting. Doing that spiritual practice on a regular basis has probably done more to help me grow in loving others with God's love than anything else. In large part, I think it's because it exposes hidden areas in me where I don't want to obey God. Areas that I was blind to and I would not have seen without doing that review. Having those areas of disobedience exposed on a regular basis allows me to more intelligently and effectively cooperate with the Spirit's ongoing work of changing me to become more like Jesus. Ongoing growth into Christ-likeness doesn't just happen. It doesn't happen merely because we want it to. We have to do something about it. Now, we don't cause our growth, but we cannot grow unless we are doing the things that allow us to cooperate with the Spirit's work of transformation in us. So, in light of this morning's message, allow me to ask this of all of us. Are we doing all we can to allow the Holy Spirit to change us from people who love with natural human love to people who love with God's love? That's what it means to be living in obedience to Jesus, which is what it means to know Jesus. Awesome. Give it up. Why don't we stand together? Um, I'm going to give you this last point for those of you who are, are uh, detailed note takers. Um, because John sort of addresses this, um, I'm having so much trouble with my notes here, but John addresses this. If the answer is, I'm having a really hard time in loving others, there's usually because there's a conflict. There's something happening, there's a loyalty uh, conflict happening. And so here's what he says in verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Like, wait a minute. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. Why are you telling me not to love the world, right? We know the context here John is speaking of is not about the people of the world, but the systems, the structures, and the values of the world. So he's saying, if you're having trouble loving others, it's because there is a disconnect between what you value the system and structure you're part of and the kingdom of God. And so the last point was, if we know, how do we know that we truly know Jesus? We leave the world behind to follow him. He said to the disciples, follow me. Whatever you're doing, leave it behind and come follow me. And so many of us, we have to ask the question, what areas of our lives, what parts of our lives are tethered to the value systems of the world and the systems and structures that are anti, anti the kingdom of Jesus. So that's the last point that John discusses there. If you're here today and you're saying, man, this is a lot to take in. I don't know if I'm ready to fully obey what Jesus says. I want to give you a simple answer from Ronald Rollheiser in Sacred Fire called I'm Not Ready. Jesus called Nathaniel. Nathaniel lacked openness. Nathaniel wasn't ready. Jesus called Philip. He lacked simplicity. Philip wasn't ready. Jesus called Simon the Zealot. He lacked nonviolence. Simon wasn't ready. He called Andrew who lacked a sense of risk. Andrew wasn't ready. 
He called Thomas, who lacked vision. Thomas wasn't ready. He called Judas, who lacked spiritual maturity. Judas was definitely not ready. He called Matthew, who lacked a sense of social sin. Matthew wasn't ready. He called Thaddeus, who lacked commitment. Thaddeus wasn't ready. He called James the lesser. James lacked awareness. James wasn't ready. Jesus called James and John the sons of thunder. They lacked a sense of servanthood. James and John were not ready. Jesus called Peter the rock. Peter lacked courage. Peter was not ready. The point you see is that Jesus doesn't call the ready. Jesus calls the willing. So if you're here today and like, man, this is, uh, this is a lot to take in. Just know that walking with Jesus is not about perfection. It's not about having it all together. It's just simply being willing to take the next step towards him.